austatud vabariigi president, head konverentsis osavõtjad, lähme oma kolmanda ja teise pärast lõunase paneeli juurde. Mõneti, kui ma olin on mõelda, et nendel sädalatel möödus sada aastat sellest, kui Venema rahvakomissaride nõukogu andis Venema rahvaste õiguste deklaratsiooni. Kui veel hommikul oli juttu, et mõnikord on tegemist ka pseudoõigustega, kes me nüüd vaatame tagasi sellele saja alaastale, eks nimad võivad öelda, kas oli pseudo või tegeliku õigusega, küll on teada, et samas novembris 1917 rahvusasjad ja rahvakomissar Stalin ütles väga selgelt, et kellele peaks kuuluma võim Ukrainas loomulikult nõukogudele. Järelikult enese määramine oli võis olla, aga mitte poliitiline enese määramine. Aga uue sessiooni pealgir nimi ongi meil siis väikeriikidest, põlisrahvastest ja inimõigustest. Aga enne, kui ma kutsun siia vestlusjuhi, veel tuletame meelde, et meie konverentsil kaks töökeelt, et küsimusi võib julgelt esitada ka eesti keeles, kuna mikrofon esitatud, siis on tõlge tagatud, et kasutage mis mõlemad töökeelt. Ja ma kutsungi siia hea meelega nüüd selle Paneeli vestlusvõi Heiko Päebo, Tartu Ülikooli Balti õpingute keskuse juhataja ja annan selle puldi üle. Suurt näru. Lugupeetud Vabarigi president, eksellensid. Mul on väga hea meel avada siis meie kolmas paneel. Ja vaadates neid suurepärased joonistusi, mida Edvard van Lõngus on teinud siis selle konverentsi jaoks. Tuletasse mulle meelde, et üks 200 aastat tagasi olid eestased sammuti põlisrahvaaste staatuses. Sada aastat iljem eestlased kuulutasid välja oma iseseisva riigi ja täna seisame me siis inimõiguste ja ka siis põlisrahvaste õiguste eest. Ja mida me siis tänases paneelis arutame? Me räägime kahes teemast tegelikult, mis on oma vahel ka seotud. Kõigepealt väikeriigid. Millist rolli väikeriigid omavad rahvusvahelistes suhetes? Me võime eeldada, et väikeriigid on riigid, mis on huvitatud eelkõige väärduspõhisest välispoliitikas, kuna rahvusvaheline õigus on see, mis tagab nende eksistensi ja normaalse toimimise ja teeb nad võrdsemaks siis suurriikidega. Ja üritame vaadata, kuidas väikeriigid on arendanud ja toetanud põlisrahvaste õigusi ja üldse millised võimalused on nendel väikeriikidel siis ÜRO tasandil või ka siis väljaspool ÜRO põlisrahvaste õigusi ja ka laiemalt võimalused rahvusvahelist õigust ja inimõigusi toetada. Ja kuna antud paneel on seotud ka Eesti vabariigi kandideerimisega ÜRO julgalku nõukogu ajutisele kohale, siis loomulikult tuleb arutlus alla ka see, mida saab Eesti teha julgalku nõukogus Ja kuna Eesti on võtnud põlisrahvaste teema üheks oma põhiteemaks, siis kuidas just teistem saab toetada põlisrahvaste õigusi ja arendada neid õigusi ÜRO julgulaku nõukogu ajutuse liikmena. Ja ilma pikemat sissjuhatuseta sooviksin siis kutsuda meie panelistid lavale. Mul on suur au kutsuda lavale panelistid. Eesti Vabariigi presidendi Kersti Kaljulaidi. Kes on ka selle siis valimiskampaania patrooniks. Järgmisena kutsun lavale professor Julian Burgeri, kes on Essex Ülikooli külalisprofessor ja kes on olnud siis ÜRO põlisrahvaste õiguste deklaratsiooni loomise juures. Chandra Roy Henriksen 
on ÜRO põlisrahvast püsifoorumi sekretariaadi juhataja. Ja tema kindlasti jagab meie ka teemasi, mis on tänasel päeval siis põlisrahvaste põhimõtteliselt mured. Taani kuningriigi suursaadik Kristiina Miskoviak Pekvard. Tere tulemast. Taani on olnud neljal korral ÜRO julgoleku nõukogu liige ja Taani on ka üks suurepärane näide sellest, kuidas väike riik saab sõltumata oma väiksusest teha suuri asju rahvusvahelisel tasandil ja loodame, et kuuleme nendes kogemustest ka rohkem. Ja palun ka lavale Jonathan Kristoli, kes on New Yorki World Policy Institute'i teadur ja kes räägib meile, mis võimalused üldse väikeriikidel suurems maailmapoliitikas kaasa lõi on ja millega nad peavad siis seal juures arvestama. Now I switch to English, because English will be the working language. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, and uh, for the beginning, uh, each panelist have uh, up to seven minutes to make the opening speech. And uh, thereafter, we will continue with discussion. We also will take questions from, uh, from the audience, but this is after uh, all the speeches are, be, are delivered. And first, I will invite Professor Berger to make his opening speech. It's up to you. Ah, okay, my choice. Well, <coughs> well good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julian Berger. Um, and first of all, my great uh, appreciation to being invited here and to talk with you um, in this beautiful city, which I've seen a little bit of out the window of the hotel. <laughs> it looks very beautiful and rather cold. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you very much again uh, to the host of the, org the organization for uh, putting the indigenous people's issues on the, on the agenda. I, I wrote something, but in the course of listening uh, to all of the interventions, it made me kind of want to, to think slightly differently. <laughs> and, and to... Um, to acknowledge that the, there are a number of discussions in relation to technology and the free fall of human rights and, and so on, and uh, my understanding uh, of the candidature of um, Estonia as a, as a member of the Security Council, which I think is really, really exciting. So I've kind of slightly uh, reflected on, on those as I've gone along, and maybe I can start with, with technology, because technology is actually vitally important to indigenous peoples in terms of nowadays demarcating uh, their territories as they're using increasingly GPS. But I have to say my, my first experience of technology um, and indigenous peoples was many years ago when I was working at the UN, sitting at my desk, which was not a very pretty desk, uh, with a very old fashioned kind of uh, computer and an indigenous representative from Panama, from the Kuna people, came in and said, where can I plug in my modem? And I said, what, what's a modem? And he, s he explained that a modem was a new technology, and we hadn't got that at the UN. So already we had an indigenous person several years in advance of, of the human rights uh, where I was working. My, my, um, my plan is to say a few words about indigenous peoples. Uh, and I want to make it sound like a little bit of, uh, of a success story, because I think it is. And when we're talking, as we've heard in the, in the previous session, a little bit about the concerns uh, that, that people have, I think the story of the indigenous uh, is, is one that is relatively, relatively positive. Uh, because if you go back in time, most states were seeking to assimilate indigenous peoples into the, into the population. Uh, make them conform, make them disappear. So we've moved from that to an era in which indigenous peoples' rights are recognized, their distinctive cultures are recognized. So it's something extremely important, and I wanted to say a few words about that. One of the things that um, is important, I think, is to recognize one of the really important issues that face indigenous peoples, 
and that cause the most human rights violations, and that is the issue around lands and resources. And that you can understand very well because much of the world's resources sits on indigenous people's lands, both historically and, and, uh, uh, and still today. And many of the new uh, required rare earths sit there uh, too. And out of that conflict, something very novel took place, uh, a very exciting story, and that was the development of rights of indigenous peoples. And I believe my, my friend and colleague Chandra will say a little bit more about those rights. But essentially the adoption by states at their very best, if I can say so, uh, adopting a declaration of their rights uh, 10 years ago in, in 2007. The core element of that, I would say, that declaration is something called the right of self-determination. And the right of self-determination means nothing more than that the peoples should enjoy the possibility of deciding on their future and the way they want to live and how their lands and resources should be developed. Now that is quite a conflictual thing in reality. States sometimes have ideas about how those resources should be uh, used and indigenous peoples may often have slightly <coughs> different points of view. So they are areas of conflict. But the purpose of creating a right of self-determination of indigenous peoples is to recognize that there ought to be a level playing field. There ought to be some fairness in the way those rights uh, are developed and respected. And that is essentially why you, it, the right of self-determination is reflecting. It's a form of bringing democracy down to the community level and saying, let them take part in that decision making, let them decide. Now, I think there's something uh, which uh, comes out of that story, which is about self-determination, uh, at least four really, really important lessons. And we have such short time, I want to just concentrate on those four lessons. And that is number one, I think looking at the way that indigenous peoples have worked in the United Nations, uh, they have seen that it is through human rights that you can make political uh, improvements and, advantage, uh, and advances. The indigenous story is not just about human rights, it's about changing the way people see uh, politics, uh, it's about putting them forward and having their presence, and the human rights has been the mechanism, the means by which indigenous peoples have been able to make these political advances. So I think it's a very interesting lesson. I understand the interest of Estonia in terms of being a small state and also being very committed to human rights, that this is a means by which you can take forward all kinds of politics, build it on human rights, say, well, if peoples have a right of self-determination, then we ought to, too, and so on. So this is a very important lesson. The second important lesson, I have four, there are probably more, um, is that indigenous peoples are very disparate, very distinct, and they live all over the place. And they manage to build a platform, a common ground, which I think has been very important. And that suggests to me that there are small states that need to do something similar, that stretch beyond the immediate area of Europe uh, and, and you go to the Pacific and you go to small states in Africa and Asia and so forth. The potential for building that platform has been very important in having a common goal. And the third thing is that indigenous people really are talking about democracy. Self-determination is saying we want to bring democracy to our level, we want to bring it down to decision making to our, our level. And finally, I think the very important thing is something which is challenging the great elephant in the room, which is the economic model that we have at this point in time. We cannot, we know, continue in this proliferate, uh, destructive form of economy, one in which you exploit continually non-renewable resources and continually D uh, deny the possibilities of resources. And I think one of the very important things that has come from that presence of indigenous peoples is to ask the question, what can we put in place of that that is more harmonious amongst, them, amongst ourselves, that is more, if you like, less, more benign on the environment in which we live and thinks forward sustainably to the future. Thank you. <coughs> okay, Thank so you very much.
Thank you very much for drawing our attention on, on the topic of uh, indigenous people and uh, how they can promote democracy and, and why it, it human rights and democracy are very crucial for them. But of course, very important, another lesson is the economic development of these communities and uh, the, the new challenges that globally we all face. Does this economic model suff suffice us today or we need something, uh, something new? And maybe really we can learn something from, from indigenous uh, people. And now I would like to give a word to Chandra Roy Hendrickson. Uh, and uh, <coughs> your seven minutes starts. You can, uh, you, okay. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone and thank you very much for the invitation to come here to Madam President and the Institute for Human Rights. It's a great privilege to be here today. I was in Estonia in 1992 and it's really very inspiring to be here amongst you years later and to see the changes, but also in terms of Estonia really coming into its own and holding its own position and its own commitment in terms of being a key player in terms of the world stage. As Julian, uh, Ms. Berger mentioned earlier, uh, the UN declaration is 10 years old this year. And this declaration now embodies global consensus in terms of indigenous people's rights. For the United Nations, it's very, very concrete in terms of outlining the steps. It's like a roadmap and it provides us with the normative framework in terms of moving forward in all fields, be it environment or development, socioeconomic, or even in terms of human rights. Now the UN declaration is sometimes asked, we are sometimes asked, does it embody new rights? No, <coughs> these are all rights that are drawn from the normative standards, from the two covenants, from other rights that have already been agreed, placing them in the context of indigenous peoples. It is quite interesting that with indigenous peoples and uh, to just uh, disclose that I come from an indigenous background myself, I'm from Bangladesh, and that when you have the indigenous people's question come in, we are, there are always questions that are raised. In terms of the declaration, when the declaration was being adopted and I was privileged to be part of the process when it was being discussed, one of the key issues, as Julian pointed out, was in terms of the right to self-determination, which is also embodied in the two covenants yet now picked up by the declaration in Article 3 and placed in the indigenous context. Self-determination is a process, it's a right, at the same time it gives the indigenous peoples the space, the context and the playing field whereby they can themselves define and identify how they want to proceed. And in this context, you have different arrangements that have come up in different countries and different contexts. Indigenous peoples are sometimes also a little bit difficult sometimes in some regions and we had the discussion this morning of Africa, of Asia, especially in these countries we have some of the uh, politi politicians and the decision makers and the leaders coming forward to say yes, either we are all indigenous or no, there are no indigenous peoples. However, even if there are differences and distinctions at different regions in Latin America or in the Arctic or in Africa, there are commonalities and this in itself was the platform within which the indigenous peoples were able to lobby and move forward and advance their rights in terms of the UN. We now have three UN mechanisms at the uh, UN in Geneva, we have the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, the special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples, and the permanent forum on indigenous issues where I am the chief of the secretariat. We also had the privilege of having four representatives of Estonia serve on the permanent forum. I don't know if he's still here. We have uh, Mr. Liv Oliver Lude who was just 
recently a member, and they have been very good in pushing forward the agenda of Estonia. And in this, I want to say that it does, size does not matter. At the UN, you have one member state, one vote. Of course, as we all know, some member states have carry a bit more weight than others, yet what does carry the member state forward is its vision, its commitment, its agenda. And we have been very privileged to have had the support of Estonia in our work at the United Nations. And we count on it very much, and I'm very happy that we have the president here because I'm forwarding a plea that please do, we do want Estonia to continue on that, especially if it is and when it becomes a member of the Security Council. And in this context, I wanted to raise the issue of indigenous women. As we all know, among indigenous peoples, there are different variations, but as in other communities, it is indigenous women who are often at the margins and those that are most likely to often face the brunt of conflict, of exploitation, expropriation, activities, and other such development uh, efforts that go on in the communities. And in this, it is the rights of indigenous women that also need to be placed at the forefront. I want to just quickly raise also the issue of the sustainable development goals, which in a way we see as a step forward in terms of indigenous peoples, because earlier in the MDGs, indigenous peoples were totally invisible. Now at least in the sustainable development goals, in the 2030 development agenda, indigenous peoples are specifically mentioned. Yet they are still among those who are most likely to be left behind. And that is why I believe that the commitment of all of us and also of Estonia, as it moves on the global arena, is very important. Estonia co-hosted a high-level event on the SDGs and indigenous peoples, and this in itself is an indication of its commitment, and I would like to urge that this commitment continues. I wanted to also mention that in 2014, the UN had a World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. One of the outcomes of that was a system-wide action plan that unites the UN agencies in terms of its work both at the global level, but in particular at the national level. And this is where also different member states, different agencies, different organizations can play a role because that is where the needs are the greatest. The UN declaration is 10 years old this year and yet many challenges remain. And this morning we also heard about the human rights defenders. As you know, there are many indigenous peoples who are amongst that. I'd like to urge you all to help us make the UN declaration a reality in the next coming 10 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for outlining uh, these very important issues for indigenous people. Uh, and uh, one key issue, what, uh, what you pointed out where Estonia could contribute on global level is uh, rights of indigenous women uh, as the most vulnerable uh, social group. And another is uh, commitment for sustainable development goals so that uh, environmental issues and green thinking uh, where Estonia also uh, tries to, uh, to play a crucial role on, on global level. But uh, another very important aspect that comes out from your speech is uh, the need for cooperation. Mm -hmm. And you very nicely draw this parallel that uh, as indigenous uh, uh, people are small communities, also small states are, are small, and alone it's very difficult mm -hmm. to, to be heard and only through the cooperation and commitment for this cooperation is possible to, uh, to make big changes on, on global level. So thank you for the speech and now I would uh, like to invite uh, Jonathan Crystal uh, to deliver uh, how the big politics is made, the real politic. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, I, I said that I would speak from the podium, but when I'm sitting here, it looks so far away. 
Um, so I think I'll, I'll stay here and, and not shortchange uh, these folks as well. Um, thank you for the invitation uh, for the prestigious event and, and panel. Um, I am a bit of the voice of pessimism and, and doom. Um, and, and what I, I'm not an expert on indigenous people. Uh, I think I would be locked out of my office when I return, though, if I don't mention that the next issue of the World Policy Journal, our institution's publication, the theme is indigenous people. Uh, and that will be out uh, December 22nd, so I, I just have to get that in so I have a place to, to go back to when I get to New York. Um, what I was gonna talk about are some of the structural difficulties that small states have in getting some of these big items on the agenda, be it indigenous people, be it uh, uh, other things, in the context of particularly the Security Council, um, and, and given the uh, Estonia's uh, bid for 2020. Um, you know, obviously, I, good ideas can come from anywhere. They can come from individuals, they can come from small states. We're in probably a, a state right now that is on the forefront of voting um, and elections. Um, but the Security Council, I think, is probably, uh, uh, arguably, and of course anything's arguable if someone ar argues it with you, um, the best place to sort of get things on the international agenda in a way that actually forces people to act or ostensibly forces people to act. But there are only a few things that the non-permanent members can do. One, they can block things, right? So you need nine votes to pass a resolution. Um, if the smaller states get together, they can stop something from happening. But without the veto power, uh, but you know, without getting all of the a permanent five, they can't necessarily get anything through. Um, and the uh, ability to get the small states together, is, it's, it's tough. It doesn't always uh, work out. It doesn't not always work out either. Um, the other thing that you can do uh, is call attention to any issue. Any member of the Security Council can uh, bring something to the attention of the Security Council as well. Uh, and uh, no matter in what position, and also you have a rotating presidency, and the president can set the agenda as well. But let me point out something about the Security Council. Events hijack the council's agenda. At most, a given uh, state in a two-year term will be the president twice, at most. It could be once. And if what happens in 2020 uh, is what happened recently, and if there is a split where the two states decide to each take a year, which could, I think, happen if the vote is close, though I suspect Estonia will win. I'm not just saying that because I'm here. Um, then you're, it's going to be one time. And if there are world events, like Syria, like uh, hopefully not a conflict in East Asia, if our president, and I wouldn't assume that he loses the next election, if our president uh, goes on a Twitter rampage, um, that will hi could hijack the agenda of the Security Council and the big issue that any given state wants to get on the agenda in that month is going to disappear. It may not disappear behind the scenes, but it will certainly disappear from the headlines. It will certainly disappear from the, uh, the kind of chatter in the hallways. Now, uh, uh, time is, is short, so I want to talk actually about the chatter in the hallways. Because the other thing that uh, the structural disadvantage that a small state has in the UN, and this goes to uh, the, the one state, one vote uh, thing. This is true, but bigger states that have large staffs can uh, uh, devote a lot more resources to any given issue and can also come up to you in the hallway and say, why don't you vote my way on this particular resolution, and if you do, I'll vote your way on that, uh, whatever that may be, and if you don't, I, your aid project that you were thinking about uh, may, not be, may not happen in the next couple of years. That happens, I promise you that happens, but I'm not gonna name names on stage and on camera, but you can, you can get me if there's a, a bar later. <laughs> um, 
and that's something that small states don't have the resources to do. They don't necessarily have the ability to pressure, but they also don't have the capacity to be, have the knowledge of every single issue, that they can know what every other state wants and what they need to sort of horse trade those votes behind the scenes. So it's another sort of structural uh, uh, problem. But uh, on a faux optimistic note, it's not always good to be able to call attention to big issues if you want to get smaller things done. And I would argue that the UN system does a great job of getting small things done and does a much less good job of getting very broad things done. This is something that in the United States we don't understand at all. Certainly our administration doesn't understand this uh, in remotely. Um, it's the smaller things to do. And Estonia, in terms of Security Council reform, I think has taken the exact right approach which is the approach recommended in this, in, in going for smaller, realistic things that can actually be achieved. If you go big, you end up potentially achieving nothing. If you call attention to the, if, I, 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 only recently have I been willing to go to foreign countries and really slam my own country, but uh, that's really changed in the last, in the last year. Um, you don't necessarily want to call Trump's attention to any sort of big initiative, particularly at the UN. I, I could virtually guarantee you he is not aware of indigenous issues as a concept, let alone any sort of specific people. That's probably to the UN's advantage. That's probably to the advantage of anyone who actually wants to achieve anything related to this. Um, going big on this is a recipe for a block by the United States. Um, and it's by going for smaller, achievable things that may not make headlines, that may not draw global attention to the issue, that you might actually be able to get things done. Uh, maybe I will end on a little bit more pessimistic uh, note. What I suspect will happen um, in, the, in the case uh, of this, the, the other th the problem that may occur is a state like Russia will uh, say it is very supportive of indigenous issues, and then it will switch it, particularly if it's an Estonian initiative, and it will say that, uh, it will then define indigenous as ethnic Russians in the Baltics, and not only the Baltics, and try to use uh, uh, Baltic-led initiatives against those states. Um, I am in a very privileged position because I have no real responsibility. I just get up and say things to people uh, and don't actually have to deal with the consequences. I do not envy the people uh, at the Estonian UN mission who I know and who are great and at all of the UN missions and world leaders who actually have to deal with these issues and uh, uh, make uh, political and strategic decisions. Um, I, I think it's gonna be very difficult but, but not impossible. Thank you very much for this um, sobering view of uh, <laughs> what the small states can do, uh, what are the structural constraints. And basically, I can take two or emphasize the two most important lessons. Uh, the one thing is, again, cooperation that also came out from, from the previous speech. It's important if you would like to achieve something, cooperate uh, to increase your size. And another aspect is be, be realistic. Don't have too ambitious uh, idealist uh, goals because uh, they are much more difficult to, to achieve. Uh, but step by step, small uh, things lead maybe in the long run some, something bigger. Thank you very much. And uh, now we move on with a small country, Denmark, who has been several times in uh, uh, UN Security Council. Um, Denmark is also one of the countries that uh, has been front, front runner in our home region, uh, Baltic Sea region, uh, for the cooperation of small countries. And uh, we would be very delighted to hear uh, Danish experiences before we are going to speak about the Estonian poss possibilities. Madam Ambassador, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Tere, 
Your Excellency, Madam President, dear colleagues in human rights and dear colleagues in diplomacy around the room. Uh, I've been asked to address the issue of ro the role of small states. And um, perhaps let me start with the question and the conclusion. So can a small state make a difference? Yes, it can. When a small state does the right thing at the right moment, and when it inspires others to follow. Can a little voice be heard? Yes, it can. When this little voice says the right thing at the right moment, and when this voice is repeated by others. This is the strength of the, the small state and a little voice. Hans Christian Andersen, he has, uh, he's Danish, uh, so uh, I mention him now. He has written a delightful fairy tale about the emperor's new clothes. Perhaps you all know it. It's actually a story of fake news. Because um, in the story, the uh, emperor is fooled by two tricksters. These two tricksters, they claim that they can weave a new suit of clothes of the highest quality, and only those who are stupid, incompetent, and unfit for their positions cannot see these costly clothes. So no one, of course, dares to admit that they, in fact, can't see these clothes, and therefore the emperor, he is in the end led to walk around uh, the city uh, in underwear. That, I hope, will not happen here <laughs> in Tallinn. That. So I know that in the story, it takes a little child to finally cry out, he is not wearing any clothes. And after that, this cry is taken up by others, and the truth is finally known uh, and recognized by all. So this fairy tale by, by Hans Christian Andersen, it meant a lot to me and made a strong impression on me um, when I was a child and when I heard it many times and I read it out to my sister because we learned that a lie can never be a lie, no, and a lie can never be the truth no matter how often it's uh, repeated. And also we learned that sometimes it takes a little voice to, to say the truth. So a voice from someone who is not so easily suspected, can be suspect, but it is not so easily suspected of manipulation, calculation, or ulterior motives. So does this mean that the truth is always easy to say? No, of course not. Is it easier for small states than for bigger states to speak out? Sometimes, sometimes not. The moment has to be right, as I said. And even when the time is right, it may still require a brave decision to speak out. And it may even require more than that. It, might, it may require national interests inside the small state itself. And it might also require some grassroots pressure. And it may also require strong political opinion in the country before a politician or a government is actually willing to find the courage um, to take a firm and just stance in the question of international affairs. So in some cases, it may also be that such a stance, a strong stance uh, in human rights is not actually taken by the politician or the government itself, but by the national justice system, which then obliges the government to act in a certain way. Often it is perceived as safer or at least more comfortable for, for a small state to just stay out of the highly sensitive subjects and especially if those subjects are very concrete and if there are vested interests, recognized interests by bigger states uh, who has actually realized that they have material interests here and now. And then it's more comfortable uh, for a state to make decisions jointly with others and to seek cooperation with others. Actually, we found, I find that there is a lot of evidence that small and truth-seeking, righteous, democratic states, um, big words maybe, that they can uh, easily, more easily pursue justice and human rights in a more generic, uh, more thematic manner uh, than in specific cases. Um, this is the, here there's a possibility for small states to, to, you know, to forward credible uh, arguments, arguments that will be believed uh, perhaps more easily because they come from a small state without big um, recognized uh, interests. Um, and, and this is more often possible in thematic issues. For instance, uh, in topics like women's rights and good governance, 
or in the fight against torture, which are all uh, thematic issues where my government has a strong um, stance and, and the same for Estonia. So another thematic example for today uh, would be uh, indigenous peoples, where again, uh, also Denmark is, is known for its active voice and um, we are the, the principal donor, I think, of the United Nations Trust Fund uh, on indigenous issues. And of course, we have national issues in, inside our own country that makes us active in this uh, matter. We've worked with, uh, Denmark, with uh, Greenland so that inside the real kingdom, the, in the, inside the kingdom of Denmark, Greenland and Denmark uh, uh, work together to promote indigenous people's rights. And so, as I said, you know, demands inside a country can actually lead to a small state having a strong voice outside. My example of indigenous, indigenous peoples, but also on torture, uh, could show that um, it's good for small states to, to work in a multilateral sphere and we can use multilateralism as a vehicle. This is perhaps the primary channel of influence for a small country like Denmark or like Estonia. We have a <coughs> chance for navigating smartly. Uh, I think that has been increased now that there is a fragmentation of authority in the world. Um, the fragmentation of authority that we see is perhaps disturbing in many ways, but at the same time it provides chances for countries that are small and can convince with argument, as Chandra was saying before, um, arguments and uh, visions are more important sometimes actually than military might, and that is of course good for us. My time is running out, so I will jump to I will jump to uh, the end uh, to, to say something uh, maybe a little bit ideological that sometimes it's, it's the easiest thing for a small state to stay quiet. Um, but we have to remember as small states that when we have a reputation for relatively high standards of human rights and democracy, justice and the rule of law, we also have a responsibility to, to speak out. Like the little boy, if we speak out, Others will say the same thing, others who are more powerful. Uh, there is a chance, if we say it at the right moment, that this will lead to something great. Like in Estonia, for instance, um, we have seen, I've, I'm constantly reminded as ambassador here in Estonia, of the moral courage that uh, can come out of small voices starting to talk. The, in here I'm thinking about the singing revolution, started singing, and then the moral courage that I witness uh, both when I read history books, but I also witness every day with Estonians. Together we can make a difference, and it all starts with one little voice. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this uh, perspective from, from Denmark, that uh, basically what, what we heard is that it's definitely easier to be quiet and let the big guys to, to, to decide how the world uh, should, should go. But we also have certain moral obligations. And of course, it requires very strong commitment internally, domestically, that uh, the, the country, people, politicians, political elite would like to support this uh, moral commitment. And it doesn't matter that you don't have big uh, military muscles. Uh, if you have strong vision and strong arguments, you're able to, to achieve. And again, I hear one key word, this is cooperation. Thank you very much. And uh, now I'm glad to uh, give a word for Madam President, the Estonian group. Thank you. And um, I have to say that with Christina, united we stand against all those who say that United Nations is the big behemoth which spits out faxes by kilometer a day. Yes, faxes, Estonians, these are indeed the machines, you know, which send you paper things. And small countries have absolutely no chance even to read all this, let alone react to this. We small states, we have taken uh, this into our own hands and supported also by bigger ones, actually managed to 
bring a change to the United Nations. The Secretary General of the United Nations, the same one who is now promising us a more coherent United Nations, a reformed United Nations, um, which would be more efficient and effective, therefore more easy to handle also for smaller countries. He was selected by the procedure which was changed compared to the last times. And it was Estonia, strongly helped by Costa Rica and 25 other countries who brought along this change. So you have a merit-based election at the Secretary General Post of the United Nations, which actually we had a big part in. And we are not the only ones. It was New Zealand who brought your Security Council climate as a security issue. It was Senegal who brought the uh, issue of uh, lack of clean water as security issue to the Security Council. It was Lithuania who brought Ukrainian question big time onto the Security Council. We have now moved to the situation where maybe finally in support of OSCE mission there will be also a United Nations mission um, in Ukraine and hopefully it will be run this way that it could lead to um, ending of the partial occupation of that country. So these examples demonstrate that uh, small states, quite to the contrary, what we heard before, are not allowed to think small, deal with little issues, try to side always with uh, somebody big. Yes, we know this saying also from the European Union that uh, small countries have uh, basically uh, three opportunities. They can say, Yes, I align my position with A or B or C, those being the bigger countries in the European Union. The European Union does not function anymore this way, quite to the contrary. It functions this way, that you have a catalyzed nation and its size is not necessary at all. And then you can bring on a new thinking processes. This is how we operate in the European Union. This is how we also operate in NATO. Think of cyber defense issues and cyber center of NATO here in Tallinn. And this is how we plan also to operate in United Nations. Yes, we are small in size, but we think big. And we refuse to act that our position would mainly be to set the agenda. That's the Secretary's job, not the Security Council member's job. You know, our world is really unpredictable. And uh, much of this unpredictability stems from uh, climate change and technological change. Technological disruption actually can help to uh, well remedy our wasteful ways of life. But it is easy also to see that the technological development at this moment especially, it actually can also add to the uncertainties of the global world. But this new world also offers many opportunities. It's quite clear that uh, the rights of indigenous people and the protection of small cultures gets more difficult if the islands where these people live simply get washed off the planet. At the same time, keeping these cultures alive and keeping also the cultures alive of small nations, small people who see their population wandering freely globally in the world is made much easier by the technological development. For example, there is absolutely no reason why you cannot keep a language alive while there may not be a land where this language is spoken, thinking of climate catastrophe scenarios for many countries. And I believe that a nation of just one million, it's more sensitive. It is sensitive to those worries of other small groups, other small nations, of course, but also, by definition, all the groups in society who are somehow oppressed. Somehow, somehow it can be indigenous people, it can be women, it can be different groups in different societies. But it is very clear that small state has a different sensitivity about inherently weak. This is something which big states simply cannot have. I give you a very simple example. In United Nations General Assembly, I met with a head of state. He was also from a very small country. And he told me that, you know, in my office while I'm here, sits a head of another small country because his office was washed away a week ago. And you know, 
they say me, you need to ask for development aid to overcome the difficulties, etc. And to him as well, that guy without any office anymore. And you know, these rules which there exist for achieving any development aid, these are simply not possible for us to fulfill anymore. Maybe it was before the last orcane or the last minus pre orcane. No, it isn't. And you call it development aid. We don't call it development aid if we are replacing the same bridge and the same houses every year now because of what has been caused by the climate change. Now, small countries like Estonia keep this in their heart and mind all the time. And I've been broadcasting this since I heard it in September in several forums, and I will continue doing so, because we need to understand that these small nations, small countries, they now need a radically different treatment. They need it quickly, and that they indeed cannot fulfill the criteria which we consider necessary always, simply because there is nothing with which to fulfill these criteria anymore. It's easier to understand, you know, if you are small and still remember the catastrophes of the, uh, well, geopolitical catastrophes of um, our uh, continent. And that is indeed something which I believe um, makes us valuable for the big ones, also on the Security Council. We have a more balanced, nuanced and sensitive view. And therefore, in a non-intrusive way, in this sense, then, that indeed I do agree, we do not have veto rights. Therefore, what we put forward, however strong we put it forward, is a, actually going for the empathy in the big leader's mind. It's not going for anything stricter than their feelings. And that is important. Take the proposal of Emmanuel Macron that P5 should waive their veto right in case there is immense human suffering. You see, big leaders, they do care emotional, important, sensitive things. And we can provide them with them because small ones know and feel these things. They can learn from us. This way, we can indeed make UN function more effectively so that we will not only be talking about peace building and resilience and uh, meanwhile there are babies flying into the fire somewhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very rich uh, speech. Uh, very interesting examples and we really can see that uh, small states can achieve uh, many things on a global level in, in the United Nations. And definitely it's uh, important to get this experience and Estonia has got the experience in, in the European Union, in NATO, which, which are important. And uh, another very important thought is that uh, we have this kind of, or the small nation yeah. have uh, more sensitivity about the concerns of uh, small communities. Uh, what uh, indigenous communities very, very often are, and uh, are able to raise the voice and attention on, on these, these issues uh, that uh, the indigenous communities maybe are not always able to, to do. So uh, before we go to uh, the questions from, from the audience, uh, I would uh, like to give a chance that you have possibility to reflect each other's uh, opening statements, so that if you have some topic that uh, you feel that uh, you would like to object or you strongly support something, then uh, please let me know. Would you like? Uh, sure, sure. No, yeah. I, I just wanted to actually to expand on what the president said about the Security Council reform. Um, you know, what I was saying before is, is a sort of a relative term. It, what Estonia and Costa Rica was able to achieve is a genuine achievement. And you know, opening the process of this election um, didn't necessarily impact who was voted for, but what it did was put into the public sphere 
or within the Senate, the statements that he made to get elected and allow some accountability, uh, it's just an act group, the first word is accountability, um, to be able to hold accountable what he said in that process, which is something that um, uh, had never happened before. Um, I'm very lucky since I don't work for a government, I can name names of other, other governments, but the, the Estonian and Costa Rican proposal was up against, uh, basically up against, not formally, a French uh, and a Spanish, I believe, um, alternative to this. And they actually had a, a, a much more a sort of, uh, I don't, again, I, I don't mean to sound like a slight, that is important, but they had a much grander sort of scheme. And even though those countries are bigger uh, in size and the population, economy, they failed at that because they uh, uh, were not actually going for something that was achievable. And Estonia, Costa Rica were able to convince all enough other countries to go with that proposal. Um, and leading off of that, my one other thing is that, uh, you know, I think, first of all, we should be careful to not lump all small states together. Um, so most states in the system, in the international system, are small. Yeah. But they are very different. You mentioned the Pacific, uh, not just Pacific, but island nations are very different than a country like Estonia, very different from a country in West Africa. And they have different levels of capacity and different technological levels. Um, and so a country, uh, you know, Estonia's been able to make outsized achievements in the UN system and in defense and other things. I think because of sort of the nature of, of the government and the, the people in the system here and, and geopolitical reasons as well, but it, it is very different. I think we should just be careful to group them all together. I'm guilty of it too. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Someone else would like to, yes? Well, in addition to, uh, to the fact that Estonia will be uh, hopefully a member of the Security Council, uh, you know, my, my government supports that very much. Uh, in order to actually get voted in, you need the support of a lot of other small states. And I think it could be argued that small states more easily get convinced of other small states' uh, problems and needs. We, we feel more solidaric, uh, solidarical with uh, small states' needs when we hear about them because we can recognize the, the difficulty of sometimes getting attention to a problem in our, in our country. Um, so so there, is, there is a, I think it's a good argument for getting all the, 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 the support of the small states that, that small states actually listen uh, better and, and react better. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. I also wanted to say that um, Estonia does not attach all of our attention to achieving the Security Council position in the United Nations. Quite to the contrary, we believe that uh, since we were helped quite a lot 26 years ago by international and multilateral communities, we sense that uh, having sprinted in 26 years from an IMF program country to an OECD member state, we have an obligation towards international community. And part of this obligation we are fulfilling by uh, sharing our experience on leapfrogging technologically, uh, much bigger, much more well developed countries. And uh, actually, uh, I think Estonia must be the only country which has a memorandum of understanding on digital subject matters with African Union, for example, to help that continent to leapfrog. It actually partially stems from our feeling that we need to pay back, partially also from our uh, frustration that Europe is quite slow to harmonize digitally and move forward uh, together. And we see that the continent which is only getting ready to uh, exercise four freedoms and, and is ready maybe to take digital on board at an earlier stage, will actually also teach something for us Europeans yet another 25, 50 years down the road. And this is the approach we take in the United Nations that we want to help, we want to support in our might. It may be small, somebody mentioned small muscle. Well, brains are equal. I mean, or less so uh, <laughs> the brain power is relatively cheap here in Estonia. We have it plenty and we know how to work, for example, in order to make the digital thing, uh, well, at least visible at the United Nations level. Uh, admit, please, that it's a big, a big issue. Estonian government already, I think it's 15 years ago, established together with UNDP, the e-governance academy, mm -hmm. which then is promoting all these development projects in the United Nations model. So we sense that we have an obligation 
global. Yeah, so it's uh, very much in line what, what also the uh, Danish ambassador said that uh, there is certain moral commitment for, for that and, uh, and, and yes, uh, we definitely, Estonia can be very, very grateful for this assistance, uh, what we got 25 years ago uh, and, and where are we now, so that uh, there is something to, to share uh, with, uh, with the world. Are there some more? Uh, okay, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just uh, wanted to pick up a little bit that, and I was reminded of an anecdote from the uh, Dalai Lama. He says, size doesn't really matter, and you only realize that when you are trying to sleep and there is a mosquito in the <laughs> mosquito net with you. So just to, not to put it, but just to say that, you know, and one of the, what we look at in terms of the, from the UN, and we've been watching how the it is with the negotiations and everything. And small states are much nimbler. That's what we find. They're much more flexible and in a way much more responsive. Maybe because of the fact that whenever you do move on anything, you've already done the groundwork. And sometimes with a lot of the big states, this is something that then comes up later as how much, how receptive is it at the community level, at the ground level? And this also brings me to the indigenous people's uh, 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 movement. When we at the UN, and I remember this is also with my colleague Julian Berger, he used to work at the UN on the working group on indigenous peoples, and for us also at the permanent forum, we say that we would like to have at the UN the largest meeting after the GA and the Commission on the Status of Women is the indigenous peoples. And in a way, that's when my UN colleagues say the UN comes alive because you see all these people from everywhere, from elders to community leaders. And the UN colleagues always ask how many members are there of the permanent forum? And we say 16 but we want the largest room at the UN. And for the opening, we sometimes ask for the GA, and they say, why? And it's, in a way, this also reflects on the voice. And this is what the, the Madam President and Her Excellency from Denmark was saying, that it is the voice that actually, not just in terms of the nuisance value, I think it's much more in terms of the moral weight, that you are actually, when you're putting that voice forward, you're putting it, on the basis of truth, of reasoning, and of common sense. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I don't want to be left out of this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as I come from a, a small country, too, which thinks it's rather big. Um, <laughs> um, but in terms of its geography, at least, isn't, isn't so big. And it keeps on maybe losing bits of it. So um, <laughs> we may get even smaller and, and have to join your small states, I suppose. <laughs> and, but, um, well, first of all, maybe just one comment. I mean, indigenous people actually are quite big, some of them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when we think about, you know, in terms of culture and language, you know, you think of Quechua, Aymara, mm -hmm. peoples in the Andean countries, we're talking about s many millions. We're not necessarily talking about small numbers of people. Uh, but there were two, two comments that I wanted to make. One, uh, and it's a bit drawn from, from the story of the indigenous people. One, you know, they did manage to bring very distinctive, really incredibly disparate peoples together. People live in the Arctic and people live in the desert. I mean, you know, who speak languages and so on. They managed to achieve something which was rather incredible, which despite the languages, despite the differences in cultures, they managed to bring them together. But the reason they brought them together is they had one project, they had one platform, they had one goal that they wanted to achieve, that everybody wanted to achieve. And I think that singleness of purpose is really something. But the second thing I wanted to say was something <laughs> is different. And, you know, of course, it, luckily there were small states, Denmark, the Nordic states, and others who were very supportive of this whole process of development of the rights. But the other thing is that I always thought indigenous people asked for the impossible. Because every time they asked for somebody something, Everybody said, that's impossible. The first time I was at a meeting when indigenous people said, we want the right of self-determination, pretty well everybody in the room said, that's impossible. That was there for something else. So I think 
Yes, you know, if, if people don't ask for the impossible, then you won't get anything. So I do think the idea of asking is possible. And I just wanted to thank also um, Christina, the, Her Excellency, the Ambassador, for telling me that the Emperor had underwear, because I always thought he was naked. <laughs> so <laughs> it slightly changed my image. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you for, for these comments. And now it's chance uh, from the audience to ask questions. Questions can be asked also in Estonian. We have translators so that then uh, our guests just have to put on the, uh, the uh, headphones. Um, please. So this slide is really blinding me. It seems that I don't see any hands. If you hand this up, then please wave it stronger than I'm able to, to see. So at the moment it's not. Okay, then um, I will uh, give a question that uh, anybody who, who would like can, uh, can reflect. And um, we have heard here that uh, there is need for cooperation, commitment, uh, and uh, it's definitely not, not uh, an easy task. Um, and uh, when we think uh, what Estonia tries to do, and as also as the as, uh, President said, that it's not only because of the UN uh, Security Council, but uh, it's broader what we would like to, to offer for, for the world or re in return. Uh, then still there is one word that uh, is in, in my mind and this is uh, capacity. Yes, military, this, this muscle power we are definitely not comparable with, uh, with uh, big countries. Uh, you said that uh, brain power is equal, but uh, definitely there is uh, another issue of what the small states are facing and this is a uh, small number of people as well so that uh, we may have excellent ideas but all of us have only 24 hours during the, during the day so um, what are the capacities and how to use these capacities most reasonable to really achieve this this goal so i see it, uh, madam ambassador well, thank you. Yes, it's true. We, uh, we have the um, same brain power, but we have less people to actually implement this, uh, this brain power. And this is why um, my, my sort of uh, metaphor with the choir is so important, uh, because I, that's what I think anyway, that, that uh, if, if you can get the whole choir to sing, that, that is much better than if you just have your own uh, little voice uh, saying something. But for that, of course, you need the, the brain to think out really good ideas and uh, really good arguments, really good visions. But once that happens and, and, uh, and you're standing in, in the choir thinking about what to sing and then if one in the choir starts singing one melody that seems right and just and uh, fair to the others and perhaps even uh, fun and great, then, then that, the, the whole choir will, will actually uh, take it up, maybe even the conductor uh, being one particular state or whatever. Um, so I think that that's the, can, the, the, the key is to not try to lift it yourself, but to try to form alliances with, uh, with others. I could just use one, one recent example that I, uh, that I contributed to my, myself back in Denmark before I came here. Um, the, 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 con the, the idea of doing something about uh, misinformation, uh, doing something about something that was uh, already in 2014 understood as something materializing as a problem. People were talking about it, but not many in the EU were, were actually doing something about it. And then a small state called Denmark had the presidency of the NB8 together with, uh, with Estonia, one of the NB8, Nordic and Baltic 8. And uh, together with Estonia and some of the other countries in the NB8, we decided, okay, we, we need to do something. And um, not least Lithuania uh, uh, also contributed to this uh, topic. And we actually managed to get the whole EU to do something. And, and we, we established in the EU an uh, East Stratcom um, uh, division, which now deals with misinformation um, 
and of course this is a human rights topic because we're talking about uh, free speech but even in free speech there are limitations like you cannot uh, you cannot lie uh, you cannot uh, um, you know th there are there are legitimate grounds for limiting even free speech so um, or at least to be able to tell when mm. something has has happened that is a lie then it you know this East Stratcom unit will tell when there is when they see that there is a blatant lie and they also contribute to telling the EU's story which is of course also legitimate uh, so that, that's an example of, of taking an issue that's really important, uh, talking about it and establishing uh, something in the whole of the EU. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, population, I uh, think we can look at the United States and say that having a population, a large population, is not necessarily going to lead you to um, effective government or good decision making or uh, any number of other things. But even on something as straightforward as military capacity, um, if you to compare, you know, Israel's military is stronger than North Korea's. North Korea is a powerful military that is by number dwarfs Israel's, but the fact that it's a bigger country, uh, a much bigger population, does not actually necessarily equal even military strength. So I think you can actually do a tremendous amount with a small population. I mean, look at Singapore as well, um, which again gets to the diversity of, of states. And I would add another C to the C words that you mentioned, which is credibility. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that Denmark has and the Scandinavian countries have in particular is an abundance of credibility, um, which allows them to get a lot done in a way that many other small countries can't. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I want to add another dimension to this discussion. And that is when you talk of capacity, you also have to link it to knowing your rights and knowing the sharing of, you know, it's linked of course also to the discussion that was in the morning in terms of technology advances. And this comes very much back to when it comes to indigenous peoples. I remember going to one of the communities and talking about the declaration and all, and that is at a very high level. But what does it actually mean to me? as I think in the morning they were discussing, I can't remember one of the presenters, that if you have a woman who knows that she has the rights to own land, but she doesn't really have that land itself, how do you link these two concepts together? And I think in that you have to have much more of an awareness raising, information sharing in terms of not just the national, but also the global level even. For instance, when we were working in with the SDGs, the Development Agenda 2030, and there are steps built in where there is supposed to be community engagement at the national level in terms of the national reviews coming in. But how many people at the national level actually know that they can go and make their voices heard and put their inputs into these reports that are going out globally and on which the country itself will be assessed. And that's big and small countries themselves. And I feel that that is where Estonia or Denmark, you have made much greater strides than let's say much uh, bigger, but perhaps not as well informed. And I was just very impressed in terms of the education levels. You know, you have Finland, you have uh, Estonia, you have Denmark, uh, when the population itself is educated, that then in itself is a capacity of themselves for them to also choose what they want to move forward with, but also to demand greater responsiveness from their own governments, from their own account with the accountability of their own governments. And that's where I believe, I mean, from the UN side, very people know they know the UN, it's the Secretary General, but not really of what happens or in terms of the normative instruments or even at the national level. And that's where I feel that much more work needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Well, as you asked what to do if you are few, actually too important information to everybody. The world is full of A, people, B, money. And that's the truth. So all you need to do is you need to make sense and you will uh, inspire other people to act. And then if you lack money, then uh, there is plenty of uh, all kinds of uh, public and private money around, best if you could use it together. A little example from the last month of EU Council Presidency. There are three really small countries who do care about uh, 
about uh, military mobility at the eastern flank of the European Union. And these three had already agreed between themselves on military mobility. So uh, it was really easy because the concept was there to attach this to the upcoming uh, PESCO discussion and uh, demonstrate this is actually a low hanging fruit for the EU defense cooperation. It went very quickly compared to the process of establishing the European Public Prosecutor Office, which we also managed to do our presidency. But the idea was already well known in 2004 when I joined the European Court of Auditors and I had to answer in the European Parliament, what do I think of it? <laughs> so you see, small ones can move quickly and they need to move quickly because they are very impatient because they know they wouldn't have energy to keep the process going for tens, of, uh, tens and tens of years. Another example from digital. Estonia has indeed an e-government, but we cannot export it straight away. We need first to demonstrate it is exportable. Of course, you wouldn't get any EU or development money for that. You need to go private. And indeed, Estonian companies uh, have created a, a digital environment uh, in a state. It's uh, a country which is not poor, not particularly big, could pay for the development to the private companies. And the Estonian private companies have created an environment uh, by which this country has risen 100 places uh, in the uh, ease of doing business index. So we now have Estonian idea, somebody else's money, demonstrable yeah. model, and now we are ready to move bigger and also take in the more risk adverse money, which would be development aid. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of knowledge on how to do it, how to export it, all we need is money. And as I said, there's plenty of that in the world. So uh, you can move modularly ahead. You have to have patience and you also have to look back maybe 10 years to find encouragement that this is not hopeless in fact. Okay, very, very good point that we don't need everything ourselves. Okay, now I already saw first hand or Juren Burger, would you like to add also something? Or no, I'm happy okay. for questions. I have okay. something yeah, to add, but I can add that Okay, so let's take the first round of questions so that now I see already several hands. Please. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jeff Jarvis, City University of New York. Uh, like Jonathan, I find myself in the position of not only uh, criticizing but apologizing for my government uh, now as an American. <laughs> uh, as we move from a bipolar world to a unipolar world to a nonpolar world, uh, run by uh, crazy men and bullies. What abilities do the small states have to save us from ourselves? To, uh, is it just the EU as a center of, of gravity uh, in competition with their voices? Or can the small states do more to, to, to push for and maintain sanity? Okay, thank you. Next question was there in, in the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. I am Yuri Otas, member of Estonian Parliament. May I turn the discussion more to the uh, indigenous people's rights uh, topics. I think the most scandalous uh, case in present-day Europe is the situation with Crimean Tartars. All the uh, Tartar population was uh, cleaned out in spring 44 and after the collapse of Soviet Union, they started to move back on their own initiative. Now they are approximately 250,000 of Tatas in the Crimea, which makes approximately 10% of population of Crimea. And uh, it seems that um, uh, uh, the least they hope for is uh, some kind of a, of a reasonable solution uh, to have their, uh, at least a part of their homeland for their own interests. So my question is, uh, can you foresee uh, any, any uh, such movement or a, a hypothetical, sensible uh, solution in the future, but because it's, it's, it's here in Europe. Okay, thank you. And there was one more question in, in the very end. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Meryl and I work in the Museum of Occupations in uh, Estonia. I was just wondering, listening to you, when we talk about the role of small nations and also the attitudes or mindsets, then what often happens, I think, is that the small sta states take the position of 
victim, being a victim. And often they are, and often this position is needed for a certain time to um, have attention or, or turn attention to small countries. But what I feel is that uh, countries, including Estonia, we often get stuck being victims. We don't take resp responsibility. Um, and while you are a victim, you kind of give away responsibility. So I'm as a young Estonian, I have to say I'm really proud of our president uh, taking responsibility and that Estonia has taken different um, ways saying that it's our responsibility to give back. But uh, I mean, how to break through of this kind of victim position? Uh, when, when comes the time when small nations or how to encourage m small nations to take responsibility and not just be victims? Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions at the moment. So, uh, everybody can answer these questions what they would, would like. Okay, we can start. Well, thank you very much and uh, I will address uh, the, the, the two questions coming from the uh, scene from my side, it's the right si side of the room. Uh, the the last question first, um, that small states could have a, ten a tendency to take the role as a victim, uh, but then the uh, person asking actually also said uh, that Estonia is not just taking the position of a victim, and I completely agree, and I also applaud uh, the president, and I pr applaud Estonia for being such an active contributor. You're not you're not only somebody uh, who consumes support uh, and uh, security support, etc. You are somebody who contributes uh, all over the world. Uh, and, uh, and this is in, in terms of security, hard security, uh, like contributing um, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, Mali, Central African Republic, and and, uh, and, and other places in the world. And I think that's really quite impressive that a small uh, state takes such a, a strong uh, stance on, on the security, international security. But it also in terms of di the digital agenda, which uh, has been mentioned before, you are really contributing to development um, and you used your ES EU presidency to, to do it. Uh, not only in the EU, where a lot of states are lagging behind, but also with the e Eastern Partnership uh, summit that you you had uh, here in Tallinn and where I contributed. You made digital uh, contributions everywhere, including also in, in Africa and the recent visits in, in Africa. Um, so small states, can they contribute to the sanity of the world? Uh, you call it sanity. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I would call it convention, uh, conventions, uh, sticking to conventions. It's I mean, there, there is may, maybe a, a tendency to, there is a, a tendency of isolationism, um, nationalism, in, uh, you know, protectionism uh, around the, the world in, in, in some places. And uh, I mean, we can see it in our own societies and our, in our small countries as well. But I would just say that small states that are democratic and globally integrated and export oriented we really rely on the international rule-based system and uh, we do what we can and uh, we also talk at very different levels, uh, not only to, to presidents but also to governors and uh, when we promote green solutions, for instance, we don't only do it in Washington. Um, then Danish co companies have a lot to offer and we you know, promote their opportunities also in the, in the states. Uh, in the different states in the United States, for instance, but all over the world. We, on, we don't only uh, speak to to presidents. Um. Okay, thank you. I, uh, just, just to, I can a answer these uh, fairly quickly. I wasn't sure if, if the last question was, uh, maybe it's just my natural inclination to think I'm the center of attention, but obviously not on this panel, but uh, if it was directed to me, I, I certainly don't think that small states uh, feel, I didn't mean to, I don't think I said anything to imply that any small states have a victim complex. I, so I don't think that's true, uh, nor should it be true. Um, the, uh, and certainly the attitudes of small states that should, be, uh, should be ambitious and should have a sense of pride. Um, what I was saying before is really, I, I do believe there are structural impediments in the UN system to small states getting certain things done. 
But in general, not everything is in the UN system. And even there, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. And there are certainly uh, things that can be done outside that system. So I certainly didn't mean to imply that. On, on, on this, the question of can, can small states save us and uh, add to sanity, this is where my deep pessimism uh, really shows through and virtually everything I, I, I write is pessimistic and I think everything has turned out worse than I have been writing throughout the course of, of the last couple of years. Uh, we talk about the international rule-based system. I think the best we can hope for now is that the uh, s small states, which again, now I am generalizing, but I, the hope is that most states, small or otherwise, maintain the international rule-based system while the uh, great powers attempt in different ways to undermine it. In different ways, because Russia's attempt to undermine it is different than China's attempt. And the US's current uh, situation is sort of trying to ignore it and, and abandon it. Um, I think we, we can hope that it can carry on and that the smaller states themselves don't abandon it, but we see some hints of that, too. Um, and the very last thing, uh, I am certainly not an expert on the Crimean Tartars, but I will say, you know, on the case, uh, uh, I've read about international law, and one thing that's remarkable about international law is that most states abide by it most of the time, including the United States, including the, all of the great powers. That said, there's the international law that applies to most states in the system, and there's the international law that, uh, that applies to uh, the P5 to a greater or lesser extent. And if we are expecting Russia to do anything um, uh, in regards to, the, to indigenous people in Ukraine, let alone withdraw from Ukraine, I think we're gonna be uh, wishing that for a long time to come. I certainly wouldn't expect it, and I don't see any possible way that anyone will force any sort of change. Thank you. Please. Well, small countries can definitely attempt to save the world, but it mostly goes this way, that uh, you talk to the leaders of the big ones and they say, great idea, I will support it. So indeed, this is quite often the knowledge transfer mechanism or the idea transfer mechanism, if you so wish. So we are indeed uh, very busy at trying to save the world. Will we succeed or not, we don't know, but every morning we get up and start saving the world because for us actually this rule-based world which we now have is the only, uh, only uh, element which will uh, well keep us safe in the future. And that's why we have a different urgency maybe to deal with it. Uh, what concerns uh, the question about uh, indigenous uh, people from Crimea, then I think uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, as I mentioned, first we need to get the reasonable uh, mandate, reasonably mandated United Nations mission on the ground, which will not calcify the existing trouble, but will actually uh, gradually be able to, uh, to uh, reunite uh, Ukraine and uh, of course uh, on, on that we can also put uh, the other elements which deal with the human rights. So uh, United Nations Human Rights Charter has a few things to say about the rights of, uh, of people so uh, and I'm quite sure that uh, this issue will uh, at some point come on the table as well but first we need uh, of course a ceasefire and the United Nations mission who is a good mandate. Um, well, just somebody word, used the word victim, and I, I have to say that um, when it's dealing with indigenous people, my whole experience of indi indigenous peoples is that very few of them ever wanted to present themselves as either victims or vulnerable. Uh, it's, it's a very bad deal to do that. Um, they are not victims, they're people struggling for their rights. And I think the concept, and actually I, I've never met the president of Estonia, I'm sitting next to her. I don't see her as a very victim kind of person. She's a very strong-willed, and <laughs> so I can only say, I think, I think that you know, you're very lucky in Estonia to have strong leadership. Um, but now, going back to um, you know, the crazes in the world, uh, it's not just states that are playing games, and it's not just states that are in this. I mean, there are civil society, and governments are dependent on civil society. They're the ones that provide their votes or don't provide their votes. They're the ones out there, activists, and we've had a lot of activists, Amnesty Friends and, and so on here. There is a big world out there also struggling for change. You know? So I think that you're not, I mean, states are not by themselves in this. There are a lot of progressive forces. Indigenous peoples 
are an important force as well, because they're asking for fundamental changes in the way the world is run. We don't want a world which is destroying all of this environment and getting rid of all of these non-renewable resources. We want something more harmonious with nature. It's a, it's a, it's a simple, if you like, rhetoric. It has a significant uh, impact in terms of um, the, the kind of management of, of the world we live in, the governments in the world we live in, uh, for the future. On the Crimean Tat, I know it quite well. I visited many times uh, Crimea. I spent a lot of time with Tatar people, while well, it was part of Ukraine, of course. Um, and they were the first to um, express themselves as an indigenous people and came quite often uh, to our meetings. For me, it's a real tragedy. I have many friends uh, still in it there and who feel very threatened by, by the Russian presence there. Um, but when we're talking about the UN and what it can do, I mean, the measures are there in place. I mean, you have to negotiate a possibility of going there, bringing down the tension, establishing you know, relationships, uh, looking at what you can do within the country that would be protecting that group at least uh, from, from the kind of persecution that has been happening and so on. Uh, I mean, it's not a big, it's a, it's a difficult task, but like much of what is on the, on the table of the UN, you know, which, which is dealing with very, very tough, conflictual situations. But, um, you know, my recollection uh, is, is very sad because the people who returned a few years back and the older people, they could remember the houses where they grew up and they went to visit the houses where they grew up. And I went with several uh, Crimean Tata, older women who went to the house and they were in tears saying, you know, my family used to have that house, but now it's past hands and so on and so forth. So this is a sort of terrible tragedy, human tragedy, that needs to be rectified, which wasn't rectified either under the Ukrainian government particularly. So, uh. Okay, thank you. Chandra Roy Henderson, would you like to reflect some of well, that? No, I was just uh, <laughs> listening, a very interesting discussion. I'll pick up where Julian was talking and I agree fully that with the question of the victimization and I think it also comes out even in the gender movement, you know, as it's not a question so much of being victims. And with indigenous peoples, they're very vocal in saying, you know, we are not victims. We want to be the ones who will actually change the agenda and make the change. And I think that's part of the whole structure and also going into the vulnerability issue, they don't like that because on one hand they're vulnerable, but on the other hand they have much that they can contribute. With the Crimean Tatars, I was just going to say that, you know, they do come to the UN, they do also continue to come to the UN, to the permanent forum, and they have been raising this issue. And uh, I was just looking at uh, Mr. Oliver Lude at the back, who's, uh, who's also been following that quite closely, but as the colleagues are saying, and Madam President very rightly pointed out, <coughs> these are issues that have to be addressed in a systematic manner, and only then can you have something that is sustainable and durable, and that is going to last. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sarasmaj. So our time is uh, soon over, then I think it's time to, to make conclusions, and uh, I think uh, during one minute, <laughs> e each of you, uh, just how you would uh, sum up what are the most important messages, what you think the audience should take with, with them when they leave this building. And maybe now we start from the opposite direction, so that... The <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's go with this, this way. Okay. <laughs> I th I, this has been actually a very interesting discussion that I have enjoyed very much and I want to say thank you. We don't often get a chance to listen to the concepts and the debate and the discourse and have this time for reflection. And I want to congratulate the Estonia for actually having this discussion on an annual basis. And what I'd like to think of as the audience to leave you with some homework is size does not really matter, it's what you do, each one, each and every one of you, whether you're at a big university in New York or you're with a small community or a, or a university academia or as a working as an official in the foreign ministry, I think it's very much a question 
of personal commitment and dedication and the strong belief that human rights are not in free fall. Human rights are here to stay and I'd like to encourage you to make sure that they don't go away. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to um, thank all those other small nations after whom Estonia has been modeling its development and Denmark is very prominent among them. They were also very, uh, very uh, intense and very much present uh, when we were in the first years of uh, uh, re-independence starting to understand that we need indeed to go into this paradigm that we are not consumers of everything, resources, security, attention by the world but we will be contributors and indeed as Denmark has been the contributor, they have also uh, taught us uh, quite a many things about how to be contributors uh, on international scheme. There are other small countries indeed, but Denmark stands out particularly also in the defense cooperation. Estonia has 23 years of experience on international missions and we have been independent again 26 years. So uh, this has been always very important part of our paradigm. And, and you know, for Estonians in the room, we can only keep this alive if we basically apply this from inside out. So uh, this, how can I contribute, uh, not only to consume, uh, this has to be a prevailing leitmotiv inside the country. Only then can you ask the rest of the world, take uh, the view, uh, the similar view towards you. And I think uh, this is indeed extremely important in holding up human rights and democratic values which uh, we have together globally developed. Thank you. Uh, let me make two points. One, uh, big things aren't working very well. Um, I'm, I'm not the first to say that. Um, the very famous finance minister of Greece, Yanis uh, Yaroufakis, was, talks about super black boxes that nobody knows quite how they function, the CEOs of companies, the head of the IMF. They don't seem to know quite what's going on. Big things are not working. Um, and, and that means that they're not working because they're not very, they're very opaque and they're not, you know, they're not open, people don't follow them. So I think this is the moment for smaller things. I mean, and the second point I wanted to make, I mean, not smaller things, smaller states, I mean, smaller, smaller groups of people, smaller I mean, lobby groups and so on and so forth. And the second point I wanted to make is that, you know, the international system itself needs to become more democratic. The UN needs to become more democratic. It start, uh, the, the UN is we the peoples. It's not we the states. That's the charter. Where are the peoples? The peoples aren't present enough in the UN. And indigenous people now, and I make a little propaganda, are working to have greater participation <laughs> in the UN. You know? uh, and, and so let's give it to them. Let's give them a bigger space. They've got a lot to tell us and so on. So we do need to make the UN itself more open to the people. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to have uh, two last points, perhaps in one minute. Um, <laughs> I will try. Uh, firstly, the dialogue uh, with civil society is extremely, support, uh, is extremely important. Uh, like small states, uh, even uh, small NGOs, uh, even individuals, uh, their voices also really count. When you have something um, strong to say, say it, and, uh, and we will listen, uh, the, and the great powers will also listen in the end. So uh, the second point is uh, actually support the small countries when they have candidatures. Please support, I'm pointing now to the D for dialogue. This is to the symbol for Denmark's uh, candidature for the Human Rights Council, uh, 2019 to 21. Please support us. And uh, please uh, make it known to everybody at home where you're coming from uh, that we are candid uh, candidates. And please support Estonia for uh, Estonian's um, presidency for the Security Council 2020 to 21. Uh, we support it with all our heart and, uh, and uh, they need support from all over the world. So please go back and, and make sure that your governments uh, also support. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, also two 30 second points on, on the question of the conference uh, are human rights in free fall. My concern is not so much uh, that they're in free fall, but that uh, they're being redefined is that's what I would worry about. Um, that had been the policy of Iran and Venezuela and why they had been close together was to redefine human rights. 
My concern now is not that the U.S. is going to join with those two countries, but that in our own way and in the other great powers' way that those rights are going to be redefined. And we are basically, the broad we, uh, are counting on you all, <laughs> like countries like Estonia, like Denmark, to actually uh, keep um, these sort of uh, rules and norms alive uh, in our absence. And uh, I think in the foreign policy community, which I sort of consider myself part of the mainstream, I will say Estonia is, is extremely popular, popular in the defense establishment, popular in the foreign policy community, uh, and it's, it's an, an honor to be here for the first time and, and with the president as well. Okay, thank you very much for these great thoughts. And um, to sum up uh, from my side, Picking up what you have said, I, as a political scientist, I formulated a new formula for, for the small states. Uh, what is the capacity for the small states? It is C plus C, means uh, commitment plus credibility, multiply with cooperation, and then you have uh, capacity as a small state. <laughs> Thank you everybody for your great contributions. It was really a pleasure to hear your thoughts, and I hope also that the audience uh, goes home with uh, some fruitful thoughts. Thank you. Aitäh, selle paneeli esinejatele. Ja kui täna hommikul räägite inimõiguste universaalsest, siis klass jõuke ilus kujund, et inimkonda on ikkagi üks suur pere. Ja tõepoolest ei ole ju neid eesmärke ja väärtusi, mis õigustaks oma pere liikme oferdamist. Et siin võib rääkida ka seda, et vältige on kohvridooja mentaliteeti. Aga nii ma täna kõiki, kes siia konverentsil tulid, osalesid siin, kaasa mõtlesid ja kas me oskasime küsida tänase päeva küsimusi. Ma arvan, et ka siin on vaja natuke ajalist vahemiku, et sellele mõelda, aga Aga loodame, et need küsimused ja ka kõlanud mõtted vastavad tänase päeva tänase päeva olukorra oludele. Tänaga kõiki meie kaastöölisi ja partnereid, kes on ainult seda konverentsi ellu viia, täna on ka meie tõlke. Ja Ja kõiki vabatahtlik ja tehnilist personaali. Ja veel on selline teade, et me ei pea kohe siit hoonest nüüd lahkuma, et see hotel pakub meil.